Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you to the organisers for giving me the opportunity of speaking uh, on medical management of AF, uh, rate control, rhythm control, and anticoagulation. The last component only provided I don't get the shepherd's crook from the chairman for running out of time. It's a big topic. It's not the sexiest topic. Andre got the ablation one. I spend a quarter of my week ablating atrial fibrillation, but this is a very important topic because I did a back of the envelope calculation this morning coming down on the plane and work out that if every site in Australia that does ablation were doing three cases a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, we'd take care of about 6% of the current prevalence of atrial fibrillation in Australia. So ablation is not going to be the mainstay, the cornerstone of therapy going forward, at least uh, in the foreseeable future, is going to be medical therapy. So what I'd like to do is approach this from the aspect of a patient that we see in our rooms or in casualty and the questions that we ask in terms of managing that patient. And these are the questions that go through my mind every time I see someone with AF. First question, how long have they been in AF? What symptoms have they got that I can attribute to their AF? Why are they in AF? Is there coexistent disease that needs to be dealt with? Have they had previous morbidities such as TIAs or strokes. Is their AF adequately rate controlled and do I want to restore sinus rhythm and if so how? Does the patient require anticoagulation? Am I happy to anticoagulate them and which anticoagulant do I use? So once that's sorted out, talk, takes a couple of minutes, we're ready to move on and treat the AF patient. These are all complex questions but the first one is how long have they been in AF? Most episodes of AF are actually asymptomatic, and we've known this for many years from Holter Monitor studies, that we're missing a lot of AF uh, because we, if we rely on symptoms. And Andre made that point earlier that our anticoagulation decisions are not based on symptoms. Many patients with persistent or permanent AF are asymptomatic, and they get picked up when they come in to have their gallbladder operated on uh, routinely. If the duration of AF is over 48 hours or it's unknown, then we are, ma we are mandated to anticoagulate that patient before we consider any attempt to restore sinus rhythm. And the important point is also that the mode of conversion has no bearing on the embolic risk. It doesn't matter whether you shock the patient, ablate the patient, or give them drugs to get them back to AF. The atria have undergone a process of electromechanical stunning, which takes time to reverse. Why are they in AF? Well, we know there are many comorbidities that can contribute to AF, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, hypertrophic disease, thyroid. Obesity and obstructive sleep apnea is an increasingly recognised comorbidity, and there can be acute triggers such as alcohol. But 30 to 40% of patients, particularly in a younger age group, may have no identifiable trigger for their atrial fibrillation. And some of these, as David Muller talked about earlier, have probably got an atrial myopathy that may have occurred from a viral infection years earlier than they present. In terms of modifiable risk factors, we've been dealt a very important uh, contribution by the uh, Prash Sanders group in Adelaide with the Legacy Study, which was published last year, which took a group of patients with significant obesity and subjected them to a very aggressive uh, program of lifestyle modification, exercise and weight reduction. And what they showed in these two graphs on the left is what they could achieve if the patients could get 10% weight loss. And the effects on freedom from atrial fibrillation without drugs or ablation, which is the red curve up the top, is as effective as any single antiarrhythmic drug that we can give to anybody. And the, sh the graph on the right shows their freedom from atrial fibrillation after ablation or drug therapy. And again, the curve up the top, the 10% weight loss group had the best results by far. So... This is a, now an important component of any discussion that we should have with our patients uh, who have obesity and we're, we're considering drug therapy or ablation. Is AF adequately rate controlled? Well, what's the definition of adequate rate control? And I'll come up to that in a moment, but we need to assess it with something better than just the patient sitting in our office chair. We need to do halt and monitor to get a feel for what their rates are doing through the 24-hour period. And one of what, this is probably one of the most neglected areas of our AF management. 
There's a classical paper by Rawls, and this is a beautiful paper that you should read if you've got some time. It was published in 1990, and it's one of those papers that harks back to the days of people saying, uh, it's written in the first person. I took this group of patients and took them to the lab, and I assessed their cardiac output and ventricular rate relation. So it's, it's a wonderful paper, but what he basically showed by measuring the relationship between cardiac output and, va and ventricular rate, that if patients resting heart rate was under 90 beats per minute, they were always on the positive slope of that curve. In other words, rate control was established if their resting rate was less than 90. It was always uncontrolled if the resting rate was over 140, and between those two ranges, about two-thirds of people were on a favourable part of the curve. What we do know is that patients who have AF do need to sit with a slightly faster heart rate uh, to maintain cardiac output than they would if they were in sinus rhythm. The RACE2 trial attempted to address the question of how strict or lenient we should be with rate control. And basically in the trial, lenient was defined as just allowing uh, the heart rate at rest to be less than 110 beats per minute, whereas strict control mandated that we try and reduce the rate to less than 80 at rest and less than 110 with moderate exercise. And what they found is that, as you can see from this graph, which looks at the cumulative incidence of hospitalizations, heart failure, stroke, etc., the group with the more strict rate control actually did statistically worse. And it was probably by being overly aggressive and as a result of excessive bradycardia. So we don't need to be that strict but somewhere a resting rate of around 90 seems to be an appropriate, reasonable uh, target. We have to say this was a short-term trial too, and we don't know what will happen if we let patients sit at rates of 100 or 110 over a longer period of time. What therapeutic tools have we got to control rate? Well, we've got digoxin, which is really fairly ineffective during exertion because its effect is mediated through enhancement of vagal tone and we lose vagal tone very quickly as we start to exercise. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, amiodarone should rarely be used. It's rarely justified to leave someone on amiodarone for rate control unless you've got no other options uh, because of its long-term toxicity. And in that group of patients, we have the option of pacemaker and AV nodal ablation. Which drugs control rate best? Well, this is about the best study I could find comparing different uh, regimens of rate control by Farshi in 1999. And it shows that digoxin is the least effective as a standalone agent. You can see it loses its uh, effectiveness quite rapidly with exercise. However, the combination of diltiazem or atenolol with digoxin was quite an effective uh, uh, regimen. So using these agents in combination, uh, provided we are monitoring them with halter monitoring and looking for excessive bradycardia and pauses, is a, is a good option. An area where it's important to maintain good rate control is in the group of patients who've got biventricular uh, devices in, pacemakers or defibrillators. And this graph here shows if you, how, uh, how much the effectiveness of the biventricular device drops off once their percentage of pacing drops to less than 90 to 92 percent as a result of atrial fibrillation. And so in this group of patients, we really have to try and target their uh, heart rate so that they have maximized biventricular pacing well into the mid to high 90s, obviously 100% is ideal. And in this group of patients, we may sometimes need to ablate the AV node to achieve that. So when is rate control an optimal or adequate appropriate end goal of our treatment? Well, all patients at the time of diagnosis have to be rate controlled. But in the, there's a, clearly there are groups, a large group of patients in whom we may decide that attempts to restore sinus rhythm uh, have been ineffective and we'll leave them in atrial fibrillation. Uh, and uh, particularly um, if patients can't be anticoagulated, so we're, we have that issue of uh, a patient with a stunned left atrium and we don't want to try and cardioavert them if we can't anticoagulate them. Or patients who've had failed cardioversion on multiple uh, occasions and we're going to leave them in AF.
A few thoughts on digoxin, because it's been topical in recent years, mainly from a large study called the TREAT AF study that really threw the cat amongst the pigeons and was telling us that by use of digoxin, we were potentially harming patients. This is a graph illustrating that the patients in this study who were on digoxin had a poorer outcome in terms of uh, uh, mortality than patients who were not on digoxin. But a subsequent analysis which was done uh, by Ziff et al. and published last year, actually looked at the quality uh, and the types of trials that were included in the initial study and did their own meta-analysis. And in the trials that were controlled adequately and therefore without observational bias, they found a neutral effect of digoxin on mortality. And they said that taking all studies into account, our review suggests that digoxin should continue to be considered as treatment option to achieve heart rate control few because I've got a lot of patients on digoxin and if we had no longer digoxin up our sleeve to treat AF, uh, particularly for our elderly sedentary patients, we would be uh, somewhat in trouble. So what, should we re attempt to restore sinus rhythm? Next question. Well, what are the potential benefits of being in sinus rhythm? They may have less symptoms, their hemodynamics should be better. We may prevent the tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy no evidence that will reduce stroke with any medical therapy except anticoagulation. We can improve exercise tolerance and we may improve quality of life. But on the other hand, the antiarrhythmic drugs we use can have toxicity, proarrhythmia, and uh, they, there are relatively poor maintenance rates of sinus rhythm uh, over 12 months. The agents we have in Australia to use currently are diazepiramide, flecainide, amiodarone and sotalol. We can get quinidine in, but we tend to use it mainly for our ventricular tachycardia patients, particularly the Brugada group. Rate control versus rhythm control was looked at in the early 2000s with a series of studies. And to summarize the results, no study showed any significant advantage in terms of all-cause mortality or stroke by attempting a, a strategy of rate control, uh, rhythm control above rate control. And in fact, the rhythm control groups generally had more hospitalizations and adverse effects. The AFFIRM sub-study, however, uh, clarified that issue uh, because the question was then, OK, is sinus rhythm really worth dying for? Um, should we be trying to get people back to sinus rhythm with drugs? Well, it's not sinus rhythm that's bad for you, obviously. It's the way you get there. And the drugs we have, unfortunately, uh, can have a, uh, a tendency to increase morbidity and, in some cases, mortality. So the, the beneficial effects of the antiarrhythmic drugs were being outweighed by their inefficacy, increased mortality, and non-cardiac toxicity. This is my only sexy slide in an otherwise unsexy talk. And this is Madonna. This is to remind you that that's the last, that year, 1985, is the last year we got a new antiarrhythmic drug into Australia. There have been attempts since. Several drugs have fallen over. Dofetilide uh, and dronetarone almost came here but didn't quite make it. So we've had a barren wasteland in the antiarrhythmic drug uh, world for, you know, 21 years, 31 years. So what have we got now and how do we use it? Well, this is the AHA guidelines for antiarrhythmic drug use. And I've just circled the ones we've got so as not to be confused by other drugs that are available in the United States. So if patients have no structural heart disease, then catheter ablation can now be considered as first line therapy, although we tend to be a little bit more conservative, which I think is appropriate, and try antiarrhythmic drug therapy first. And you can use either flecainide or sotalol. And amiodarone should very much be third line uh, agent considered without structural disease. And in general, you wouldn't go to amiodarone these days without at least considering catheter ablation. In patients with structural disease, coronary disease, sotalol and flecainide would be contraindicated with significant obstructive coronary disease or scar. And amiodarone is then uh, considered second light agent after sotalol. Catheter ablation is, in experience centres, finding an increasing role, particularly in the group of patients who have heart failure. Um, uh, for, and uh, 
we are doing an increasing number of those patients in our own uh, hospital setting. If patients have heart failure, then the only drug you can really safely use that's not going to uh, have adverse effects on contractility would be amiodarone. Just a few, have I got any time? To, no. So anticoagulation, well, it's a small topic um, and you can all read about it and uh, maybe next time we'll have time to speak about it. Thank you very much.